Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to this meeting. Tomorrow, the Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2012 will resume its second reading debate uh, scheduled. And um, some, um, the day before, we received a request from a member to call a meeting. This is to clarify the m mechanism to adjust um, the build buyer stamp duty rate and the special stamp duty rate in future. The administration is uh, already here, and I would like to thank the administration too for coming to the meeting at such short notice. Now, I have to declare interest. Uh, I own properties. I'm an accountant and a company that hires me, provides some um, taxation advisory service to different uh, businesses, including advice on um, property transaction stamp duty, but I'm not involved in such work. Dr. Ken, uh, Mr. Kenneth Lung. I'm a tax consultant. I own properties. I, or, um, I also am also involved in taxation advisory services. Mr. Andrew Leung and uh, Mr. Wang Ting Kuang. I would like to uh, reinstate my f previous declaration. Ms. Emily Lau, I own properties. M uh, Mr. Pun Xiu Ping, I, I own properties. Mr. Alan Leung, I'd like to repeat, uh, declare, reinstate, uh, uh, re reiterate my previous declaration. Mr. Lan Chi I own properties. Ms. Um, Chen Yun Han, also, you're going to renew your declaration. Uh, Mr. Wang Kokin and Ms. James Toh, yes. So uh, um, the Secretary's advice is that uh, we should declare before we speak. That's why, as the chairperson, I should take the lead in doing so. That is, when there are new proposals in a committee, that I would declare my interest in accordance with the rules of procedure. Now, before the meeting, the administration has uh, submitted a paper on the latest information about the future adjustment mechanism of the rates of BSD and SSD. Um, the uh, Legal Service Division has also provided a paper upon my request. The English version was uh, forwarded to members beforehand, but the uh, members may, if may ask for your understanding. We, there's a tight schedule, so the sec uh, legal advice is to work um, to our tight schedule, and I'm grateful to them. Perhaps I will first invite um, uh, briefing, uh, an introduction of the paper, and then we will take questions from him. Mr. Abraham Sheck, well, I haven't made a declaration. I would like to declare what I've previously declared. Thank you. Mr. James Toe, do you wish to first um, put forward your prayers before you ask the Secretary to respond? Well, the uh, legal advisor has a uh, paper as well, so after the Ministry has spoken, perhaps you could also ask the legal advisor to take us through their paper. Okay, then, Ms. Um, Agnes Wong, please take us through the paper, and then the legal advisor could also supplement the uh, written paper, which is self explanatory, actually. Ms. Wong? Thank you, Madam Chair. The details are spelled out in the paper. Well, of course, uh, in uh, within this week, there seems to be a different interpretation of the proposal. So, Madam Chair, thank you for giving us the opportunity to explain the whole uh, proposal again. Now, I'm sure our members all understand this. Under the current stamp duty ordinance, Cap 117, there is not a mechanism to say how SSD or the new BSD could be re revised. If so, I want to increase the SSD or introduce a new BSD. We need to do so by way of a bill. That's why we have the Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2012. For this reason, we've also proposed in the bill to introduce a new mechanism of a subsidiary legislation. We propose negative vetting as the mechanism. If in future there is a need to adjust the BSD or SSD rate, then we could rely on the negative vetting mechanism in making the adjustment. So that's how this all came about. In the um, government's bill, we proposed negative vetting. Uh, we've explained the reason why that's the case in the past. I don't want to repeat those points. Now, why, but, but briefly, why are we proposing negative vetting? Because for the BSD and the SSD rate uh, uh, mechanism, it's uh, market sensitive. It's sensitive. It's also time critical. In other words, we need to respond to the market quickly. So, in the um, uh, in terms of subsidy legislation, we have proposed to 
adopt the negative vetting mechanism. So in future, if there's a need to adjust the rates, there would be certainty. This is to avoid speculation in the market, is to prevent people from spreading rumors. So there's a whole purpose for that. Now, of course, some members have expressed concern that uh, by doing so, the government is taking away the power of LegCo to scrutinize subsidiary legislation. But uh, I would like to point out this is still negative vetting. That, in other words, there is vetting involved. And under the established me negative me vetting mechanism, within 24 days or with an extension of 21 days, uh, a total of 49 days, more than one and a half months. Within this period, the, the uh, members could consider either amending the subsidy legislation or oppose it altogether. So th we are not taking away the powers of electrical members to vet the subsidy legislation at all. And then Mr. James who has proposed positive vetting. And then Mr. Martin Liao has proposed uh, what I call a mixed model. First on Mr. James Toe's positive vetting proposal. Now, we've already explained that uh, in previous papers. I won't uh, repeat the details. Now, it's still subsidy legislation, but it will take a much longer process because first the government has to give notice to say that we plan to make the, uh, such amendments. And if the uh, LESCO believes there is need to set up a subcommittee, um, then they would do so. But there is no time limit for positive vetting. In other words, uh, in principle, uh, it could take us to the end of the um, LESCO term if necessary. And then after scrutiny, we have to again give notice uh, for the method to be tabled, for the resolution to be tabled at LESCO, and then we have to uh, amend the rates afterwards. Now, here we're talking about market-sensitive and time-critical arrangement. So it is not desirable to do so by positive vetting because we need to respond uh, quickly to market changes. Now, Mr. Martin Leo has proposed a mixed model. That is, that uh, we could um, gazette the notice and um, the rates could come into effect at once, but there is a condition that is the FS would still uh, table a resolution, would still have to table a resolution LESCO for scrutiny if LESCO rejects it, or after six months, Lesko has completed the scrutiny, then the notice would um, cease to have effect. But what are the uh, what is the drawback? Uh, just now we talk about um, the um, time required and the uncertainties involved in positive vetting, so it's the same here. And if uh, the Lesko chooses to either change the rate or rejects the um, the, the, the resolution, then we we'll have to make refunds. Or if uh, there's any change to the rate, we may have to recover the difference. Why do we consider it in this, uh, not desirable? Because uh, if the government wants to tone down on these harsh measures, maybe LESCO uh, doesn't agree, it thinks that uh, we shouldn't go that far, and um, toning down the, uh, watering down the harsh measures, then um, buyers may not be able to decide what to do. And by the time we want to recover any difference, uh, maybe the property has changed hands, so it will be more difficult to pursue the original buyer. Uh, but then, and also, we allow time for making rates, and we will allow room in the market for rumors to spread. People will say, well, Leshko is now considering it, so sell your properties quickly or buy quickly. So it's not desirable when there is such a transition. That's why uh, we still believe the negative vetting mechanism is the right one to go for. But then in the past week, uh, the Secretary has uh, been talking to different members and political parties. It seems that the biggest concern is that when um, we do in um, uh, toning down the harsh measures, we should act quickly. But uh, if you want to make the measures even harsher, shouldn't you allow members sufficient time to consider it? That's why the administration has made an undertaking. That is, if the bill is passed, and there is the negative vetting mechanism in the bill. But the administration has undertaken that we will only adopt this mechanism when we need to, and when we're going to um, reduce the rates. But if there is need to increase the rates, even though there is a relatively faster mechanism, we won't um, do so. We will still introduce a bill properly, like what we do now. And we will um, then seek the views of Lechko. Now, some have suggested that it's not been done before, but it, actually it has been done before. That is, uh, in a bill there may be a negative vetting mechanism, but still the administration could choose to introduce a bill instead. So this is nothing new in terms of law drafting. 
some members questioned whether this undertaking is uh, dependable. But I'd like to say again, this is a solemn pledge by the government. The Secretary has already said so openly, and today in the paper it's spelled out in black and right. And uh, during the resumption of second reading debate of the bill, he would repeat his undertaking. So this is not a casual undertaking. So we would therefore like to secure member support, and this because this is our way to respond to your concern. This is the proposal we've put forward, and we would like to have your support. So I try to explain the different approaches just now quickly, because it seems that in the past week. There seems to be some misunderstanding among the public. That's why I'd like to take this opportunity to explain things. Legal advisor, thank you. The paper is self-explanatory, but do you have anything to add, please, to the paper? Well, I will repeat what the um, Deputy Secretary said just now, just on the uh, to highlight some points. The uh, legal effect of a formal undertaking, if I may say something there. Now, there is a designated official in accordance with uh, Article 22 of the Basic Law to state uh, uh, to give a government's undertaking. It, this undertaking is in itself not a piece of legislation. There is no legal effect, so um, there could not be any recourse, um, a judicial recourse. But uh, of course, uh, members could pursue the matter through the political process. Now, Article 60. Or section 63A itself is clear in meaning. So there is actually no need for the secretary to, uh, speech to be used as a supplement in interpreting this particular section. Now, four members have uh, raised their hands. Uh, I'll propose four minutes for now, uh, but I'll be very flexible. Mr. James Toe. I can see now what we mean by officials um, can have more say. The administration says it wants to respond quickly, so it won't agree to my amendment. And I've explained already. With my amendment, it can be done quickly. And then Mr. Martin Liao proposes immediate effect. But then the administration wouldn't support it. But now, all of a sudden, the administration uh, comes up with this proposal. If it's to make the measures harsher, we could do it by um, uh, free reading, through free reading. So it's all up to you, it seems, administration. And as the legal advisors pointed out, this is just an undertaking. And uh, this undertaking only binds this term of government. And what is this term of government? I don't know. Is it up to 2017? Or when this uh, chief executive steps down? What if uh, chief executive uh, CY Leung is re-elected, unfortunately, then is this still this term of government or the next term of government? So I think you have to explain that. But most importantly, there is no legal effect in this approach. I don't know if the administration agrees with the um, uh, legal advisor. It doesn't matter if it's solemn, it's, there's no legal effect. And if you really want to proceed, what can we do? We can't stop you through court process. And do we have a crystal ball in which we, into which we could gaze? That is, uh, for harsh measures, uh, we have to act quickly. But if you want to tone down the harsh measures, there's no need. But, but, but where, how come you have a crystal ball to decide? And um, if it's um, past the um, amendment deadline, then, then the administration may all of a sudden say that uh, there is different approach with um, increasing the rates or reducing the rates. Uh, it's passed. The House Committee reports everything. So you should at least allow time for members to consider the committee stage amendments. Down, but now all of a sudden you've come up with this new approach. Are you trying to be cunning or what? So, so can you, the ex ex administration explain why you want to do this? Otherwise, I can only really say I really don't know what you're up to, and if that's how you do things without any rules or procedures. Well, come on, the uh, mid the public would uh, have to depend on you to stabilize the property market. Uh, you can't even re respond properly to members. It's also chaotic. You keep change uh, going back on your words. Then how can you give confidence to the people that uh, you could respond to um, the public concerns? Miss Wong, 
I think the member has raised a number of points. Let me first of all clarify this. We haven't proposed any CSA. This is because we still hope that the members will support the negative vetting mechanism, and therefore we have not come up with a new amendment. And therefore, it isn't a matter of after you have reported to the House Committee, you, we are now introducing a change. No. Even if we have got a subsidiary legislation mechanism for an ordinance, uh, we can always present a bill to amend it. Say, for example, in the year 2011, there was this bill uh, to amend the motor vehicle registration. Um, we can, uh, by way of subs we could have, by way of subsidiary legislation, amend the tax rates. But then we have chosen to use the format of a bill to change the first registration tax rate. So it isn't something new. Another example was the year 2008. I don't need her to explain the example. Let her explain, and then I'll give you the floor. No, it's not a matter of whether you can take the initiative to use a bill. I just want to know whether it has a legal effect. So it is very simple. Um, now, if you use a subsidiary legislation to enhance the race, uh, is there a way that we can um, have recourse in court? Um, well, it was said that we w were not uh, law abiding or we would not follow the conventions. Well, I have to say that we have been allowed by the law to do so. And then if members are really worried, that is, you don't know whether we're going to be bound by our words, and then we'll try to challenge the electrical, and somehow, to, for no reason, we try to rely on negative vetting to increase the rates. Well, I think uh, if the administration is to do this, I don't think the electrical would easily allow this to happen. The electrical's undertaking is not just to be given to the electrical, it is also given to the public at large. So there is this question of promising the public. So I don't think that there comes a day that we break our promise. Now, you don't believe in us, you think that uh, we may resort to negative vetting, but I don't think we can easily get our way. So it isn't that we make an undertaking and then we won't be bound, bound by it. I think it is not quite likely, so perhaps you can consider this point. Now, even if you say that uh, you can trust this term of government, you have no confidence in the future terms of government, of course, no one can say anything on behalf of future terms of government. I just want to say that for the new term of government, if it is not to follow this undertaking, then that government will be under great pressure to explain and justify itself to the legal and the public as to why the promise is to be broken. So the Secretary has said that he can't speak on behalf of the future terms of government. I think he's merely telling you about the facts, but then if future governments do not follow this, then um, it is under great pressure to explain the matter to the legal and the public. Next, can you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I've been involved in Hong Kong taxation for almost 20 years, but I really don't know what the government is up to, to be frank. Just now, Ms. Wong explained uh, the matter to us, the, but then the more she tries to do so, the more uh, puzzled I am. It is said that uh, Chapter 117 does not have a mechanism to amend the race. My question is, under the current SDO, we have the schedules, and then we have got the uh, 4.75 percent uh, for share trade um, for different kinds of uh, transactions. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I was referring to the case of SSD and BSD. There isn't a mechanism therein to talk about the adjustments of the race. Now, for other tax rates, are you saying that adjustments to those tax rates are not market sensitive? Only SSD and BSD are market sensitive? If the stamp duty is to be enhanced from 4.75% to 10%, you are still saying that it is not market sensitive? Well, they are separate issues. Today, we are talking about SSD and BSD. It's impossible for us to lump together all other things under the stamp duty ordinance. It is also beyond my scope. I can't agree with her, Madam Chair. We are still talking about the same piece of ordinance, SDO. 
uh, though we are talking about different kinds of stamp duty. One is the SD stamp duty, another SSD special stamp duty, and then BSD buyers stamp duty. All of them have far-reaching consequences on the uh, buyers, and also it will have an impact on the public coffers as a tax category. I don't think that um, such taxes are different from each other. They are all called stamp duty. Now, basically, what Ms. Wong is saying will only generate more questions in my mind. Now, for those tax policies having an impact on the public coffers, when would the government resort to positive vetting, when negative uh, vetting, when uh, subsidiary legislation, and when in the form of a bill? Well, we have got so many different kinds of taxes and duties. So I want to know about the government's policies. I think that's the basic question I want to ask. My question is more than this bill. This is because um, the question that arises is even more broad in scope. And in future, when we have tax-related bills, then uh, we are not sure as to what mechanisms you will invoke. Uh, maybe you would have uh, positive vetting and negative vetting for increases and decreases, respectively, or vice versa. So you will upset my sort of uh, charts in, in this mechanism, and they will have far-reaching effects. So we have to sort out the matter. Ms. Wong, well, let me say this. Today, uh, it is the teach that is dealing with this matter. This is because the SSD and the BSD are dealing with market changes. So this is a tool rather than for the sake of profit revenue. So we're relying on this as a tool so as to cool down the property market. And we hope that through the increase in the transaction cost of non-Hong Kong PR buyers, uh, we can sort of cool down the market and we can also uh, give priority to the needs of the Hong Kong residents. Therefore, uh, the target of the bill is very clear. We are increasing the stamp duty, in, uh, we are enhancing the SSD and we are introducing something new, the BSD. Therefore, all I can say is that I can say as much as I have already told you that that's it. For different bills, different pieces of legislation as to when we'll use subsidiary legislation and under that when we're going to resort to positive and when negative vetting, there are different rationales behind them and we still need to seek your uh, endorsement before we can get uh, get it through. So what I'm trying to tell you today is in relation to the scenarios uh, behind the introduction of the two sorts of stamp duty. Now the government is saying that whether um, we are going, we are using positive and negative vetting because they would like to have immediate effect. But we did have the experience of reading a bill three times in a go to have immediate effect. Here we are talking about collection of revenue. So uh, what's wrong with it? Of course the bill was poorly drafted. And that's why the government is to be blamed rather than the members for taking such a long time to do it. Now you say that it's very simple and then in, in fact it would be very simple to adjust the rates whether to increase them or lower, uh, lower them. Now. The LegCo would like to scrutinize the bill. We would like to scrutinize the legislative proposals. Perhaps you can just resort to administrative means instead of relying on the LegCo. But I think the LegCo plays a very important role, and I cannot agree with you in relation to the difference between positive and negative vetting. Now, what you are saying that you you want you prefer negative vetting, but then when you want to increase the rates then uh, you re rely on a bill. Now, it seems that the pro-establishment camp has become the opposition camp, and maybe some of them are really the royalists. So please explain clearly to us. You may not be able to use positive vetting. Now, we have gotten a number of bills, uh, stamp duty amendment bill 2012, and then another one in 2013. Now today, as of today, we haven't collected the stamp duty. Uh, the IRD would only be keeping a record. Uh, within 30 days of enactment of the bill, we will be collecting the revenue. Yes, I know that. Time and again, I've said that for the SSD and the BSD, when compared with other tax 
classes, tax rates. Um, they are hugely market sensitive and it is also time critical. In other words, it is important as far as the timing is concerned. That's why I'm saying that we don't want to send out any signals so that in the interim there will be a huge degree of uncertainty and then people with ulterior motive will be spreading different messages. So we have negative vetting being proposed because once it is gazetted, it will come into effect effectively. Everything is certain and clear. We know about the type of the tax as well as the rate of the stamp duty. The LegCo may veto it. If the LegCo would like to do anything about it, um, the rates can be changed on the same day that the LegCo endorses the motion. So it is not a matter of uh, being open to market speculation as to whether it will go up or down. So we want to send out clear messages. We don't want to um, allow speculative activities to take place. And that's why we have proposed the negative vetting system. As to why not positive vetting, I've already explained. For positive vetting, um, there is no time limit for scrutiny. Now, different members have different backgrounds. They represent views from different classes. No one can tell how long it will take to finish the vetting. We don't want to see this scenario happening. We introduced the subsidiary legislation, and then people start to spread the messages, uh, warning that uh, people better buy up or sell their properties because there will be changes. We don't want to have the spread of um, uh, messages. Um, that would um, increase the uncertainty. So whether we are talking about positive vetting or negative vetting, we are still talking about something established and proven to be effective. Still, the LegCo will have time and powers to vet it. But of course, I agree that for negative vetting, we're talking about a shorter period of time, at most 49 days with 28 plus 21 days. But then if it is something very important, if we are very focused in our work, I think we can still do it and it's more preferable. Mr. Abraham Shank, Madam Chair, how come you did invite the Secretary to come here and answer our questions? A, a Deputy Secretary here, she doesn't represent the principal official. You know, this, um, you know, uh, when uh, you and Jeffrey Lamb talked about this great proposal, Jeffrey Lam. Um, he also chaired over a bills committee. How come after for a year and so you never came to talk about this great proposal? Do you think we're not important? Do you think this bills committee does not exist? I've been a legal member for thirteen years. I've never seen this happening at a house committee. Now, there's the House Committee Chairman. Uh, we have already been to the House Committee to report on this bill. But then, uh, how come you, you just ignore us? Uh, James Toe asked, how come uh, the government is doing this? The government didn't tell you. Let me tell you why. Don't think you're a lame duck. You're actually a tiger. Now, you said at the Bills Committee meeting, if uh, you, uh, the administration would not support your positive voting, then the six votes from the Democratic Party will be lost. And so they worry. So you're not lame dog at all, you're a tiger. Because, you know, uh, in the, you know why? Because uh, CY, the CY Lens government never has got so much support from the Pan Democrats in this uh, council. That's why immediately they sent someone from the pro established government to come back to revive the idea. How? They asked uh, Martin Liao to take your concept and come up with this amendment. But then um, uh, you, you, you say you will support it and the other pro in the pro-establishment camp are not happy. So that's why they have to ask two executive councillors and someone else to do this. You know, um, I've never seen this happen in my 13 years in this council. This was not discussed at the Bills Committee. The, the, uh, no procedure was followed. No reasons were given. No concept was explained. When I first came a Lashko member in, 20, in the year 2000, there was this shot-powling incident. Those um, 
who, you know, uh, involved in corruption have two me uh, measuring tape, uh, one for the long pass, the other for short pass. Now, uh, they're doing something similar. They don't follow rules when they feel like it. They propose passive vetting. When they don't feel like it, they propose negative vetting. Now, the, there's no change to the principle. It's just a matter of interpretation. It's a matter of statutory interpretation to interpret what the judge said at the time. Uh, it, it, it's like uh, it was the pepper and heart, but the, here uh, you're just saying it's different from uh, than the pepper and heart case. You're just saying, um, well, the, the government official is saying that just trust me. Now, for those uh, Hong Kong permanent residents under the age of 18, they've uh, heard the Democratic uh, the, the, the Deputy Secretary that uh, they should be given exemptions because they were born in Hong Kong. That's what the basic law says. With uh, sought legal advice, they shouldn't have to pay the 15% stamp duty, but our great members, uh, Regina Yip, I don't know if she's here. Again, she's uh, next to member too. All of a sudden, she said that those um, age under 18 shouldn't be entitled to this exemption. All of a sudden, she's become the NPC standing committee. She's interpreted law. Then how can we trust you? If people hurt you and bought a property, today, now they will have to um, fork out um, over a million dollars for the 15% stamp duty. Uh, you haven't asked any questions, so you don't get a response from the administration, right? Now, I will ask questions later. Uh, in another round. Any response, please, from the administration? I don't know how I could respond to speculative remarks. Uh, he again mentioned um, the minors issue. I've uh, said, I've explained it many times. I've also so, so, so submitted papers, so I don't propose to supplement further. Next, Mr. Alan Leung. Madam Chair, talking about great members in another capacity when uh, there was this piece of legislation for Article 23 of the Basic Law. At the time, the then Secretary of Secre Security made it very clear um, that uh, legislation for Article 23 was just there for, for just in case. That is, um, the law itself may be stringent, but uh, the enforcement would be liberal. Just trust me. That's what she said then. So how is it different now? Let's say I could legislate to say that the government could uh, kill, but then the government would say I'll, I'll choose not to kill. For Section 63A, the administration has uh, no intention to ask for a leave from the president. Uh, so the administration could propose an amendment to Section 63A tomorrow. The president has this um, prerogative, but the administration has not asked the president to give this uh, waiving of notice, because then if there is this amendment, um, then in the future um, there could be negative vetting. Uh, but we're told that the secretary might say during the resumption of second reading debate to say that yes, we'll do so, but we're not going to do it this way. It's like what I told you. You give the government the power to kill, and but they, they say we won't kill. How is it different? Do you go about legislating? Um, law like this, you know, the legislation exercise itself is uh, solemn, is sacrosanct. Now tomorrow, if you want to resume the second reading debate bill and you pro go for something so drastic, I would suggest uh, that you rather not do it. Now, um, you you won't get there still. But if something goes wrong, in future, of course, the secretary would not uh, take up responsibility. He would say that, well, let's go has passed it, so the blame will be put on us. I don't think we don't have much of a choice. If the administration believes this negative vetting mechanism has a problem, then you should go through the normal procedure, that is, withdraw the spill. Or if uh, you c think you could work through the night, then you ask the president to give you leave tomorrow to move a committee stage amendment to Section 63A without notice. That's the way to go about it. And I, finally, I'd like to um, discuss this with the Deputy Secretary. She said twice why there's a need for negative vetting. It's because for this uh, so-called harsh measure, 
Now, um, it's market sensitive for it to be effective. It's also time critical. So, Deputy Secretary, you're saying that the uh, Secretary will give an undertaking that uh, if you're going to uh, make the measures ha harsher, you will not um, exercise the powers given to you under Section 63A. But um, it's exactly when um, you make the measures harsher, it's especially uh, market sensitive and time critical. But then you say that, well, under the circumstances, we undertake that we will not uh, do so by negative vetting. We will go through Section 63A. In that case, you render the harsh measures not harsh anymore. So uh, I, I don't follow your logic. Um, can you please explain? Deputy Secretary, let me clarify. The administration has never said there's a problem with the negative vetting mechanism. No, we've never said so. That's why we do not pr plan to move a CSA to change this. Uh, that point has to be made clear. What we're saying is uh, that we have no intention to propose any CSA because we don't propose to amend the current uh, clauses. Just that the administration has heard the concern that uh, there should be more opportunities afforded to members to scrutinize the uh, measure. That's why the administration is giving an, an undertaking that uh, it, when there is a need to make the measures harsher, um, even after this bill has been passed, when the government is empowered to go through a simple procedure that is by way of negative vetting to uh, uh, revise the race, the administration will choose not to do so. Instead, it will submit a bill. Now, uh, I said um, the measures are market sensitive and time critical. It's true. I'll give you an example. For some reason, the uh, because um, uh, say let's say um, as many experts have predicted, uh, there is an exit um, strategy uh, for many countries. So um, people are getting out of the property market. We may need to make the measures less harsh. Uh, we and if we do not have such measures, we will not be able to restore the market quickly. That's why it's important. So and um, with um, harsher measures, we agree. Uh, we, we have insisted all along that actually negative vetting is the right mechanism, but uh, because we want to respond to members' concern, that's why we are willing to make this undertaking. All we're saying is that um, is about the approach we adopt. It's not about um, making the law and then changing it. No, that, those are two separate issues. So what the government is doing is going a step further in meeting members' concerns. Now, we've uh, de talked about this bill for um, over a year, almost one year and four months. And the market and the public would like to see an early decision on the matter. That's why we're taking the step. So that's the whole idea, really. Ms. Emily Lau. I think the administration has acted most improperly. Now, you said you wanted the public to do something. Yes, I agree. Uh, of course, there are some in the community who oppose the bill, the developers and so on. And for some others in the community, they're really unhappy with the market condition. That's why they say, oh, yes, it's good to, um, you know, do this first. But then you've been talking about it for a year. You never proposed any ma new measures. But now we've reported to the House Committee, and then all of a sudden, now, Mr. Martin Liao, he's not even a member of the Bill's Committee, and then he's actually proposed a committee stage amendment. He's proposed a CSA, and, and because he's not a member of the Bill's Committee, nobody ever has a chance to st uh, consider it. Now, we kept asking if you made him move the amendment, and he uh, denied it outright. But uh, maybe if uh, we had a chance to study that CSA that would have addressed our concern, it would be great. But now, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want the CSA. And then two ex-school members met uh, with you behind closed doors, and then afterwards they came out to say something. But we never had a chance to study it. Now, of course, we, uh, we, uh, I hope the public will understand, yes, we do want to act quickly. But at the last minute, you have come up with all these uh, new proposals, we didn't have a chance to discuss it. I talked to the secretary on the phone. Um, uh, he should come and talk to us, but he's not here. The permanent secretary is not here. 
those responsible should be here. And now you're made to come here, Deputy Secretary. Of course, we have great respect for you because we've, you've been talking with us for over a year about this bill. But anyway, you know, it, it, it's, it's so we're all really puzzled. What's this about? Now you said the secretary will make a undertaking tomorrow, and that's not legally binding. I don't, or people say they will believe in you. I don't know why, but but it sounds so odd. That either should be positive vetting or negative vetting. But uh, but you say no. In this circumstances, it will be negative vetting. In those other circumstances, it will be positive or whatever. But then it's not legally binding. Now since you want to do it, so why don't you move an amendment? That is, you do this, this uh, uh, in this scenario and do that in another scenario. If people uh, support you, 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 this will be passed in electrical, but you wouldn't even do that. I think it's uh, ridiculous. You think members uh, have, have, do not have better things to do? Now it's because all of a sudden Mr. Martin Liao moved to CSA, nobody had a chance to discuss it. Now you've given an undertaking, it's not legally binding, but uh, you might do it. So is this all wishy-washy? So do you think Lash Coast will support you this way? It's so strange. The Secretary's undertaking, there is no legal effect. And he's not really keen to do it. So it's possible that he might not do it, right? Deputy Secretary? When individual members move uh, Communication amendment is beyond our control. If you ask me, of course, I would like to see no CSA, so the bill is passed in its original form. But of course, members have the right or power to move CSA. But why a member moves CSA so late is not for me to say I, 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 on his behalf, because I don't know why. Now, coming back to the undertaking, I agree. The undertaking itself is not a piece of legislation. It's an open undertaking. Uh, or political one, if you wish, but it's an open undertaking. If so, for some reason one day the administration chose to renege on this undertaking, it uh, insisted on negative vetting. I do not believe this Lechko would let the government off the hook so easily. No, no, that's not my question. My question is that you still want to do it. Uh, uh, what uh, the two exco members talk to you about that is in future, if you're going to make the measures harsher. That will be something like a positive vetting approach. So you do it. It's like amending a piece of legislation. Uh, but um, with um, um, reducing the rates, you're going to act quickly. Is it because you're subcon to pressure of developers? Mr. Chek, do you agree? No, no, no. You, I don't, I'm not asking him. Maybe you should ask him to move over there then. Deputy Secretary? Well, I don't think we've ever said that. Uh, that if we had succumbed to the pressure of developers and the reference sectors wouldn't have uh, so many different views on this bill. We're just saying that um, when um, there's an exit strategy, uh, that may be, there may be turbulence in the markets. That's why we will have to act quickly. It's the same with uh, making the measures harsher. And, uh, but here we are just trying to respond to members' concern. We are willing to take this further step. That's all I can say. However, uh, many times you ask me, now, um, why hasn't we? Why haven't we done it sooner? Because, or even to this day, we believe the negative vetting mechanism is the right one. That's why we've never come up with this other proposal. But now we are uh, in the last minute of um, a passage of the bill. We want the bill to be passed, and since there's so much concern from members, so that's why we're willing to make this undertaking. So in future, you may just follow the bill. Then, now I think we have given this uh, undertaking in black and white. I don't believe this term of government would uh, so-called deceive people. Uh, I I just said that if for whatever reasons one day the administration chose not to um, deliver on this undertaking, because this is an undertaking made openly, it's not just made to let go. If for so whatever reasons uh, we insisted on negative vetting, do you think Lashko will let us through so quickly? No, so it's not really so easy as some may depict. But then uh, you will, it will happen like what uh, Henry Tang said, that uh, you're cheating, you're telling lies. Now, this is a solemn assembly, so think this through very carefully. I hope you won't do it this way. Mr. James Tan, I must um, commend the Deputy Secretary. There are so many poignant questions. Um, she's had so many meetings with us. Still, she insists on what she's been saying all along. 
and then she is uh, saying that uh, that uh, it seems that a few members of the pro establishment camp we we you know pan democrats like James Toe, Emily Lau we've met and then just now Abraham Sheikh, Lem Tai Fai or Porte mm, you know they may also have some views so I think it will be tough for the government anyway let's come back to this bill I better advise you to make a declaration first. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. I am involved in the business of uh, property development. Now, let me come back to the bill in relation to the government's undertaking. I really hope that the administration will give it detailed consideration. Why do we have the legislative council? Why do we have laws? This is because when a judge is to adjudicate in a case, he will make reference to the laws. When a judge hears a case, I don't think uh, that we have to rely on the undertaking of a particular official. Are we talking about the mainland conventions? In the mainland, there may be a governor of a province giving a taking that your factory may go on forever. Now, in Hong Kong, does it mean that we no longer have to enact laws? It means that lawmakers will have an easy time. We can finish our work. In future, no laws will be presented to us as long as the administration is to give laws of undertaking. And that's it. But then. How can the court make a decision? Uh, will the judge look at the legislative intent or the undertaking? Now, let me talk about the timing. Now, how much more time would you need to deal with this amendment? Maybe a month's time. And then together with the budget, maybe a month or two. Now, you haven't yet collected the revenue. Yes, the money is with the law firms. Uh, you're still having it in the coffers. Yeah, virtually. So it doesn't matter if you uh, defer by a month or two. Now, the administration is not going to make any proposals concerning CSAs. Now you will give an undertaking. You ask us to take your word. Well, of course, pan Democrats won't take your word. And even for a pro establishment camp, Mr. Wong Kwok Hing, after experience of the LSP, the um, uh, offsetting mechanisms will no longer have trust in you. I think this is the fact. Now, of course, uh, you may say that the CE is not part of the government, and so his electoral uh, pledges. The CE candidate wasn't yet a member of government, so his electoral pledge could not be regarded as a pledge of the government. Now, tomorrow, you are going to resume the second reading of the bill. I want to ask this question. Are you going to move an amendment shortly? Now, um, the Liberal Party will vote against the bill at the third reading, but I'm sure you have got secure. Uh, you have already secured enough votes. So, are you going to consider moving an amendment shortly, or are you saying adamantly that there won't be any amendments, and then your undertaking is that until the end of this term, things will remain like that? So, would you just um, have the undertaking? being valid for the rest of the term or what? Ms. Wong, let me sort it out. Let me clarify. We are talking about the undertaking of the content of the bill. It's about the approach of amending the stamp duty rates. So for this approach, I think under any bill, under any legislation, this provision is um, available. This approach is available. I talked about the first registration tax for motor vehicles. That was a case in point. There is the subsidiary legislation mechanism to adjust the tax rate. The government did depart from that and relied on a bill and had it read the third time to endorse the new race. So it has an approach available to us. We aren't here talking about changing the tax rates themselves, and we ask for your trust. Now, we're talking about the approach. We won't be using negative vetting for this matter. We'll be relying on the introduction of a new bill. So it's about the approach rather than the content of the bill itself. I hope I can clarify this. Allow me to clarify and follow up, Madam Chair. My question was very simple. Now, maybe we endorse the bill, and then the administration comes back with a uh, amendment, so as to bring out your intention. This is to improve upon the legislation. 
facilitating the court's decision. If you say that you won't do this, then we'll be forced to take it, and then we'll have uh, we are asked to have faith in you. But then、um, this is very different from what you have just said in your reply, Miss Wong. Yes, I got Mr. Tian's points, but we have no intention to do so for the time being. Mr. Porche, let me declare: I have properties, and also during the、um, scrutiny of the bill, my family members acquired properties. For the point made by Miss Wong, this is exactly why we are concerned. Now we are here being asked to endorse the approach rather than the content. Now, for paper against heart, we can、uh, rely on that. But currently, the undertaking is not legally binding. Three points from me, Madam Chair. First of all, we've been scrutinizing the bill for so long. The mere fact shows that、uh, the arguments put forward by Miss Wong do not stand. We have taken so much time, so. At most, you will need one or two or three months' time to complete with the drafting of the CSA. Now, the market hasn't experienced anything bad. Now, if the administration would like to enhance the raise, reduce the raise, the government just make an announcement. I think the market is prepared for adjustments to raise. Just as what Mr. Shack has said. Anybody under the age of 18 for such minors, at first they thought that they could be exempted. Now, as long as the bill is still being scrutinized, there's no certainty they know it, and that's why the administration has been lobbying us for taking on board Mrs. Regina Yip's、uh, CSA, because minors should not be、um, allowed to. Um, have the assumption that that would certainly be endorsed. If they do anything on that assumption, they have only themselves to blame. Now all transactions are being done through law firms, and solicitors' firms、uh, have got the provision all the time. That is when we're presented with a bill, and there may be changes to the rates, and then lawyers on both par- of both parties will protect themselves. They will try to make a provision, and they will have the money in the、uh, accounts. So we're talking about huge sums of money. We will certainly do this, even for things、um, of a simpler nature. Say, for example, payment for utilities, payment for rates, etc. We will keep the money in the account for such large sums of money. I don't think anybody would sort of do anything disregarding the possible changes to the rates. And then for Kenneth Leung, I think he's right. Now, Miss Wong has been saying that we aren't talking about the、um, generally seen or commonly seen tax uh, uh, categories. We are talking about the、uh, demand side management、um, initiatives. Miss Wong is,、uh, has told us about the first registration tax,、uh, and he and but then that together with the alcohol duty are also sort of、uh, market sensitive. So I cannot understand her logic. That is why. Those others are not market sensitive, and only this one is market sensitive. Why is she saying that this is one of its own kind, and it should not be treated like any other tax raise? Now, for Miss Wong's arguments, now if you say that you have a special reason, and therefore we should abandon our very vigorous approach, and we should tolerate the government's practice, though this has been done many times, but it type two children born in Hong Kong or the、um, baby formula ban, well. You may say that this is expediency, or you want to be categorical. You would be decisive to respond to the public sentiments. But then sometimes you act so quickly, so swiftly that we are caught by surprise. But then, in the course of it, we have found many loopholes, and we have to do a lot of remedial work. So, if you have got any special reason, please tell us. If the reason is sound,、uh, we may find it acceptable. Otherwise, a so-called rationale is not really acceptable to us. For us to take. So many departures from the conventions and from what is being right to do. So either you defer it or you apply for the waive of the、uh, notice and come up with a CSA. Miss Wong, I can't agree with Mr. Chair.、Uh, he's saying that we have taken so much time. It doesn't hurt if we have more time. 
No, 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 no. Uh, let her have the floor. I think she has misunderstood my word. I have to clarify. I'm not saying that it has dragged on so so long. I'm saying that it has dragged on for so long. You say that、uh, you said that、uh, the market might find it unacceptable if we had to spend more time, or there might be mixed signals. But then we have been sending out the signals for so long, and the market is still all right. So why are you worried that it would need to take more time? Well, I was about to say that it was most undesirable, but then、um, the ordinance itself hasn't got a subsidiary legislation mechanism to amend the SD, and that's why we would like to introduce this mechanism. In October 2012, we made the first announcement about this uh, um, initiative. Uh, in, due, in the course of it, the market was unstable、uh, because there were there was room to spread、uh, different messages. We don't want to have so many speculative messages. So I have to point out that the current situation is undesirable. In future, we、we'll、try to avoid the same from happening again. For、uh, tobacco duty, for first registration tax, we have said that they aren't as market sensitive as this one. Because for tobacco duty, for vehicle first registration tax, they are usually、um, announced as part of the budget speech. For SSD and BSD, I think they would affect even more people than tobacco duty and vehicle tax.、Uh, it will affect the entire property market, not just whether you have to pay the duty or not. It will affect the macro economy as well. Therefore, we have to make adjustments in a timely fashion so as to respond to the market changes. Now, for the market changes, we don't just count on the circumstances in Hong Kong. We are subject to external factors as well. Now, for the stamp duty, yes, the RRD is not collecting it yet. But then firms、uh, are collecting them on our behalf. But lawyers have also told us that they are worried. They want to. They don't want to sit on so much cash. They want the bill to be enacted so that they can hand over their duty.、Um, so we want to enact the bill early so that all the relevant segments、um, will benefit from it. Mr. Lam Tai Fai. And then、um, I would like to read out the names in the list: Sid Ho, Tommy Chung, Regina Yip,、uh, Wu Chi Wei. All right, Mr. Lam Tai Fai. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to declare that I do own properties.、Um, in the In her opening remarks, Ms. Wong has said that in the past week and even earlier,、um, the administration has been in contact with members from different political backgrounds, and in response to such contacts,、uh, the administration is willing to provide this undertaking. In the case of an increase of the stamp duty, there will be a new bill, and then for downward adjustments, there will be negative vetting. I just want to say that since the establishment of the bills committee, since the introduction of the bill, no officials have、uh, contacted me. So when she said that they had come into contact with political parties, I think they just contacted those that they would like to meet with. For me, no contact at all. So、um, I. My view is that she likes to meet with you and、uh, Jeffrey Lam, and also non-BC members like Mr. Martin Liu. So I have reason to believe that. I think you are doing it behind closed doors. You have a private、um, understanding about the tactics. So、uh, I'm really angry, and I cannot agree with you. Um, the legal adviser during this meeting has said that a verbal undertaking from the administration won't have any legal effect. When something happens, if the government is to go back on its word, we can only、um, do something in the political process. We can only hold the accountability of which shows、uh, accountable. But. Even if the CEO or the principal officials have to step down, it they it only serves them right. But what about the losses suffered by the property owners or somebody makes a wrong judgment and they makes a、uh, a acquisition wrongly, who is going to、um, be held accountable? Now, for lawmakers, my understanding is that we are supposed to scrutinize the bill. 
Now here we are asked to scrutinize the verbal undertaking. Is it really part of our work? Is it our responsibility? So if we agree to this verbal undertaking, is it legally binding? I have got so many questions. You need to answer my questions before we can move on. I really don't follow it. Well, the deputy secretary said that um, I don't. Be- yeah, you said that you didn't believe that the administration would go back on its promise, or let's go would let would allow the well, let's go to go back on this uh, the, the allow uh, allow, uh, allow uh, uh, let's go would allow it. But you know, have you read the um, opinion poll findings latest by uh, Chinese U? Uh, trust in the government is only twenty five point three percent. Those not trusting government, thirty eight percent or half half. Trusting or not trusting, so you can see uh, different people may have different degree of trust in the government. While well, you are a civil servant, you are loyal to the government. I appreciate it. You should do so, but then not every member in the public shares your trust. And then even in the past day or two, uh, Anthony Jones been saying this that he could only represent this term of government. Well, then that's the problem. Let's say after a year or so, for. Uh, uh, some CE candidate uh, come out to say that uh, I support a free economy, I cherish Hong Kong mainland uh, relations, anything that will affect that I won't support. And when I um, elected and I plan to amend the legislation, well, if that's the case, then people may choose to sell their properties. So on the 30th of June 2017, that will be the golden day. Let's see who wins. And then, because as uh, soon as as soon as he wins election, he will um, change. Uh, he will just say that I don't accept this uh, verbal undertaking. I'm going to change the arrangement definitely. So, how can you just um, rely on verbal undertaking? Now, Deputy Secretary, you don't have to answer me. I will wait till the second round. Madam Chair, if I could uh, clarify, I have to clarify this. Have you, can you clarify whether you've been in touch with me, Deputy Secretary? Please respond. Let me clarify once again. Just now, Dr. Lam mentioned two points. I'm concerned that he might be misunderstood. No, we're not uh, amending the legislation verbally. We're just saying that we give an undertaking that we will introduce a bill. No, I, you ha- you've got me wrong. I know, of course, you're not going to amend the law verbally because uh, you said that just now. And then Dr. Lam said that if the government doesn't go by its promise, something would go wrong. Let's assume. Let's assume if the government. Um, didn't um, prom- honor his promise that uh, it um, went with try to um, increase rates through negative vetting, but even by negative vetting, it will still have to come back to Lesco. So it is not going to incur loss on owners. So we're not talking about taxation itself. But then there are so, so many messages in the market, it will be difficult. Because uh, when there are so many different messages going around the market, it, it will lead to problems. Now, I'm saying that uh, it won't cause um, uh, confusion in the market. Mm, Dr. Lam, please allow the Deputy Secretary to respond. Now, the so-called problems, in quotation marks, is the government uh, would not uh, honor its promise. It, uh, tr- it refuses to um, introduce a bill. Then how can it revise the rate? And it will have to go back to negative vetting. And that's all. A negative vetting would not cause confusion to the market because uh, the, the by negative vetting the uh, measure must still come to LegCo for your by uh, for scrutiny by you. So at most, if the government doesn't um, honor its promise, this is what happens. So you say it, it, members may not trust the government. No, it's not for me to say whether to trust or not. Uh, the government, but um, opinion post says um, otherwise. That's all. Ms. Sitho, I'm not a member of this bill's committee. Secondly, my interest uh, is the same as many others in the community. I can afford to buy uh, uh, properties. Now, uh, it's just uh, for your own deck, uh, own consideration. But I have a uh, um, o- um, property for own occupation. I'm not required to declare it, uh, even in other circumstances. Now, if the government does this and Lechko would allow them to do so, that is, uh, you, that you agree to scrutinize the verbal undertaking, then you are causing harm right away because it's against all our established procedures. Um, it undermines rule of law. The official just said that it's not about the content of the legislation, it's about the procedure. So can I ask the administration this? Cap 1, 
uh, interpretation and general clauses ordinance. Uh, this order is all about just um, procedure and so on. This um, do you, would you say that's a piece of law? It is because it's cap one. It's the first piece of legislation in Hong Kong laws. Section 63A is it not part of the bill? How can you say that this is not uh, part of the law? It's just a procedure. Procedure is part of the law. The way the government acts is governed by laws. So you we this one this point must be clarified. I cannot accept officials confusing facts like that. Uh, this is a procedure spelled, governed by the law. You dare say it's not a procedure. Uh, it's not a law. It's just a procedure. That's totally wrong. You know, for the scrutiny of this bill or, or any bill, if uh, we've completed the scrutiny, then when um, principal official speaks during the second reading resumption, uh, uh, he could say that the government won't need to follow this procedure, then that's, what's the point of scrutinizing any bill in future? Now, this is a new version that no one has ever seen, and it's become the rule by which the government will act. So in future, after we've completed scrutiny, many bills will come back like this, then of course it's ridiculous. Of course, the Deputy Secretary tries to present it nicely, that it's, a, it's just that the government would not um, exercise this uh, power, that's all. But that means the government is not following the law, so how can that be right? Madam Chairman, a member of this bill's committee, I won't talk about the revision well, uh, upwards or downwards, whether I support it, but I'm talking about the way it's being handled. It's totally unacceptable because it's spelled out clearly in the law that it, there will be negative vetting. But during second reading, you could say that you don't need to follow this procedure. I think that's ridiculous. So what you should do is to defer the resumption of uh, second reading of this bill. If you want to do this, then you should present an amendment to establish the procedure. You can't just go for speed. Now, if you um, make an amendment, uh, you, it just takes you several weeks. So we have um, council meetings on the 19th and the 26th of March. It's uh, taking you more than a year in uh, so far. How, why, you mean you can't wait another month? is ridiculous. And if we start this president, we're opening up a can of worms. I don't think this whole legislature should accept, to, should allow you to them, to um, destroy our procedures like this. Deputy Secretary, let me clarify if I've not made myself clear. I try to make it clear that uh, during the course of discussion, members seem to have the confusion that um, here, uh, maybe it's about um, changing the percentage. I'm just saying that it's uh, the way to do it. In terms of procedure, of course, there is the negative vetting procedure. And I've tried to explain this many times just now. Now, for any piece of legislation, if there is a piece of subsidy legislation under which uh, revisions could be made, the government could still choose not to use that uh, negative vetting mechanism. We've done it before. Instead, the administration could choose to introduce a bill to um, effect the amendment. It's happened many times before, so it's not that uh, the way we do it now is illegal. No, we've done it many times before. I've uh, quoted two examples, like when we um, uh, just downwards the uh, wine duty, uh, that is the 28, the dutiable commodities amendment bill 2008, or the bill on uh, revising downwards the first registration tax for motor vehicles. We have introduced uh, bills in both um, cases, although we, c we could also do so by an active element, but the government chose to introduce bills instead. Let the Deputy Secretary respond first before it's your turn, okay? No, no, the rule is... Uh, no, I think she's confused everything. She's deceiving the people of Hong Kong. Here, there's the protection of revenue ordinance. Here, we're not talking about tax revenue. Deputy Secretary, do you have anything to ask? Yes, yes, there, there is a revenue protection order, but at the same time, we have to do it uh, with a bill at the same time. So the Deputy Secretary has responded to me, so I have to respond. But can you please wait for your rung as past five minutes? Because you spent four minutes to speak to you, to, to respond to me. Uh, please, one or two short sentences, please. Unless you don't allow, gov because it's the same with other members. New change. 
this new change happens within five days of voting. We have to allow the council to understand what's going on. We have to allow the public time to understand and to discuss uh, what the uh, Martin Leo's amendment is and what um, um, the secretary's uh, verbal undertaking would uh, do to rule of law, how it would damage rule of law. Uh, you shouldn't just um, secure enough rules, ro uh, votes and then you push it through, that's all. Mr. Tom E. Jung, was this is exactly the case where the government secured enough votes, that's why it's proceeding this way. Now, I've been at this council for more than a decade, I've never seen the government do something like this uh, at such a late stage. Just now, Mr. James Tan has um, offered a way out to the administration. That is, after today, uh, you could come back later. Or, or, or you don't even need to defer it. You could just um, ask for a waiver uh, uh, of the notice period. That's all. So it seems that you're not very sincere at all. You're saying that, oh, it's fine, I'll just take this up. I'll take up the responsibility. It's not a matter of who takes the responsibility. It is when this council considers bills, how we scrutinize the bills, well, we have to be accountable to the voters. All these years, um, in my experience, in scrutinizing bill in the past, we would easily uh, believe in the officials. I've done so twice, and both on both occasions, uh, they've let me down. It's the same. Uh, it was a uh, Sari Lao, Lao. There was Sari Liao, and then there was. Um, um, Eric Yao, and uh, the, the, it was the same chief executive, Donald Zhang. They promised the sector they would do something, but they did not do so. Now, what the uh, chief executive said during the election, even though it was an election pledge, you know, I was let down before. So it doesn't matter whether you respond to me or not. I have no questions, really. But all I would like to say is this, um, Madam Chair. Just now, um, colleague, I think it was... Um, Mr. James Toe, who asked how come the government is doing this. Now, we've seen how the government act all these times. I'm sure it's because they uh, managed to uh, convince some members. It gives them a um, um, way to change the position, that's all. But I would ask these members to think this through carefully. Can you be easily swayed like this? Uh, I'm not going to change my position. Well, I'm oh, sorry, I forgot to declare I don't have a property, but I may plan to buy a property. And during this period, I don't know if many any of my family members have bought or sold properties, but probably they have done so. That's why I'd rather make the declaration. Any response from the administration? No, not really. Next, Mrs. Regina Ip. Madam Chair, I declare I have uh, properties. I plan to buy cheap too, I hope. Now, must a policy be implemented through legislation? There are plenty of examples in Hong Kong that for many important policies, we do not rely on legislation for them to take effect, but rather we rely on administrative measures or undertakings. For example, uh, immigration rights or entry rights, uh, which uh, um, affect um, human rights a lot. I think for members more or less my age, you would recall that in the past there was the touch base uh, policy that is for mainland uh, illegal immigrants, if they reach the urban district, they would not be repatriated. There was no legislation governing that. It was just an administrative measure. But then there was an influx of illegal immigrants in October 1980, at a time the then Secretary for Security abolished this uh, touch base uh, policy. There was just uh, three days of grace period. It was all done verbally. And eventually there was actually a court case because someone challenged the government. They said the government misled them. They sought judicial review. They came to Hong Kong, but at the end they were repatriated. And at the time, many officials just um, – uh, actually, the officials' a verbal undertaking on TV was presented as court evidence. So for all these years, um, it's in the government's tradition to implement many important policies through verbal undertakings or administrative measures. And verbal undertakings could be challenged in court, actually. I'm sure the Deputy Secretary knows that very well. Tomorrow, the Secretary is going to make a solemn undertaking. I'm sure he must be very careful. Uh, with the, his wordings, that's the first point. The second point, uh, people I've met, including property agents 
Uh, this um, has dragged on for so long. They would like to see early passage because with early passage, there is less confusion, there are less uncertainties. Now, the property agents complain to me they're really suffering because of um, the decline in transaction volume. No, but um, if um, the uh, prices drop to a certain level and stabilize, because everybody wants to buy cheap, then at least for property agents, they'll get more business. Because now we don't know if the market will go up or down and people are holding back um, in buying properties. But then if people know that uh, this measure has been introduced and, uh, and the government will not um, withdraw the harsh measure or uh, if they uh, they know that uh, if the, there's a change in the market, the measures will be withdrawn, then they will have confidence going to the market. Now, I don't need a response. What about the solemn pledge? Are you afraid there will be court cases? Because people may um, just uh, seize upon what the secretary said and sue you. What, what protection do you have? We note members' views and we'll go back to relay the message to the Secretary. Yes, please remind him. Mr. Wu Chiwai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two points here. I've been listening to the discussion. All along, the Secretary, I mean the Deputy Secretary, has said that they think that uh, she's worried that the time taken will be too long. For Mr. Martin Liu's uh, CSA, of course, we haven't had time to give a detailed discussion. But then the effect would be that the new tax rate uh, will come into effect immediately. But then there will be an ensuing period of scrutiny. No. Um, the government's, uh, rather the legislative uh, council's uh, power of uh, scrutiny will not be affected. Now the purpose is to bring it into immediate effect. Um, now since a member has already proposed a CSA and if it is to be carried, then it will become part of the bill, and I think this is more in line with the spirit of the bill. How come that the administration is saying that even for an amendment like this will not be acceptable, though the spirit, I would say, is the same as yours? This will facilitate more effective um, enactment or more effective um, approval, and you don't have to rely on split voting. Time and again, Ms. Wong is saying that um, when there is a solemn undertaking and um, the administration, uh, I mean the electrical, would not lightly endorse anything from the administration. Now you are saying that with the solemn undertaking, uh, if the government is to go back on its word, then the um, members have been asked to go through the political process to challenge the government. But as long as you can secure 18 votes, the members' amendments uh, cannot be carried. That's the crux of the matter. We hope that at a time of um, agreement at a time of approval. We hope that uh, it can reflect the views of the majority. We don't want the minority of the members being able to um, make sure that the government gets its way. So we aren't talking about something which is the same. The scenarios are different. Are you able to give this undertaking that is if the government is to challenge us and um, you won't rely on simple voting rather than split voting if the government is to go back on its word. So are you sort of implying that split voting will be cancelled? But I don't think it will be put on the agenda. So Ms. Wong, please tell us what do you think about Mr. Martin Leo's CSA? I think the spirit of the CSA from him can give effect to uh, the amendment uh, immediately. Why are you saying that it's not acceptable? Why would you refer to, uh, prefer to have something so awkward as in the form of a solemn undertaking? Ms. Wong, for Mr. Martin Leo's uh, CSA, we regard it as a hybrid form of CSA. Now, it will come into effect upon cassette of the notice with conditions. That is, um, at most, there will be six months' time. And the LegCo must give approval in six months' time, and then the FS must move a motion um, 
So if in six months' time members cannot finish with the scrutiny, then the notice will lapse, and members will not be able to amend the notice because six months would have already passed. Now it means that by adjusting the rates, it means that we still have to check whether the electrical has changed the rates upwards or downwards and by how much and then we have to make adjustments to the revenue collected. So on the face of it, it appears to be immediate effect, but then there are certain conditions. We have to recover or refund the difference and it will only make things even more unclear. And that's why we're saying that this is not an appropriate approach. We have repeatedly said that for the undertaking to be given, in fact, the current mechanism does allow us to do so. The only difference is that we are giving an advance notice that is one day if we want to increase the race, we will be resorting to the introduction of a new bill. Now, uh, for switch voting, it is a broader issue. There's about constitutional issues. I'm afraid it cannot be addressed in this bill. Now, it's my turn to ask questions for the first time. Well, of course, if I have to do with this. Mr. Abraham Shack named me and Jeffrey Lamb for meeting with the secretary, and that's why we've got this one. Abraham Shack, I think you will remember that it's not just you, but also Emily Lau, who have talked about t at the getting tenser and tense of the relationship between the LegCo and the Exco. Now, I'm also Exco member, and I'm duty bound to relate the views of the Booth Committee to the executive and try to lobby the officials um, whenever I have the opportunity. Now, in relation to Hong Kong PR companies, you say that there should be a refund mechanism. On more than one occasion, I have lobbied on your behalf. And then in the course of the scrutiny of the uh, uh, bill, um, you have been concerned about the negative vetting mechanism. Uh, even. When Mr. James Cho uh, raised it for the first time, I've already started to take it up with the administration. Now, it isn't something that is plucked from thin air. Uh, this worry has always been with us. It has always been with the Bills Committee. Maybe I've got it wrong. If I've got it wrong, please tell me that I have got it wrong. What I'm trying to do is to discharge my duty and try to reflect the concerns of the Bills Committee. I hope that the admin can sort of um, do something out of goodwill so as to address members' concerns. So um, for the negative vetting, um, well, in fact, um, the figures, the tax rates will be very much market sensitive. And I don't think it's easy for the electrical to come to a consensus. Even under the process of negative vetting, the electrical can veto the, um, the suggestion. We do not want to defer it because, as Mrs. Yip has said, in fact, as the long title shows, it is something um, first introduced in 2012, so it's not desirable to postpone it. And then we'll have the budget, and we may have filibustering. And these are the um, facts, and I, uh, I do not agree to deferring it. Now, if we are to retract this, and we ask the administration to retract the uh, reference to an undertaking, will it uh, uh, resolve everything? Now, I stand to be corrected. I think the administration is not going to move his CSA. I think things are very clear. The legal advisor has also given us his opinion. Now, if members find it unacceptable to have this undertaking, uh, which hasn't got any legal effect, then you just regard it as a negative vetting mechanism, and then you make up your mind accordingly. Now, before us, we've got many options. If we find the negative vetting mechanism unacceptable, you can either choose James Toe's CSA or Martin Neal's uh, uh, CSA. As far as adjustments of tax rates are concerned, if tomorrow the government continues to resume the second reading, you you still have many choices to um, uh, reflect your opinion. So I just want to explain why this came up, how this came about, and it isn't something apart uh, from thin air, and. Um, 
to me, um, that's how I understand it. If I stand to be corrected, and I hope you can understand that, uh, in fact, all along there has been liaison between the both committee and the administration. Now, I do. I didn't want to see this happening. That is causing you to have uh, so much concern. The DB doesn't favor deferring the resumption of second reading. Now, uh, you can make up your mind and choose among the few options available concerning the amendment uh, mechanism. Four members would like to speak in the second round. I suggest of three minutes each. Mr. James To. Madam Chair, let me answer your question. You said it's not plucked from thin air. Well, I have to say that you are the chair of the Bills Committee. If you have got other opinions, you must have told us, you should have told us at our meetings. Why not? Now, we have already passed all the deadlines, deadlines for CSAs, deadlines for uh, giving reports to the House Committee. How come that you went with Jeffrey Lamb? Uh, to meet with the government for two hours, and neither of you have told us about this before. So it seems that um, you you have tacit um, uh, understanding with each other. Now the greatest problem that I find is that now James Tian has given advice to the administration. Um, verbal undertaking, no deferment, and then uh, use a bill to confine. The verbal undertaking, so uh, or to confine the negative vetting to the scenarios, like, uh, but then the administration is saying that no, it won't do this. Now, are you s you are saying that in principle negative vetting is fine, but you are not insisting on it. So I find it difficult to understand. Now, Mr. Martin Neal is not even a member of the Bills Committee, and he is not present today. But everybody is entitled to do so. It's mysterious. But then he represents the business sector, so I can understand him. Maybe he has been working very hard. Maybe he's watching it second by second, and that's why he has um, um, proposed the CSA. And it's really wonderful because um, even the DP finds it excellent because this is uh, in line with the government's wish of immediate effect, and you need 36 votes. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Abraham Shek scolded me, but then if the administration would like to do this so as to get the six votes for the DP, then it's fine. We are only concerned about the constitutional uh, element, and we are in favor of the uh, double demand side management initiatives. How come that the administration is presenting us with something so awkward? Well, administration, you don't agree with Mr. Martinio's CSA. You have told us, so it's mind-boggling. Six months, six months uncertainty. There, there is something still outstanding. Now, even if you abide by your undertaking, there is a bill to increase the rates. But does it mean that there's nothing understanding? It's mind-boggling. It will take even more time than six months. There is still a great degree of uncertainty. So the administration can can say whatever you like and give us whatever reasons you like. Like what Tommy Chung has said. Now, if we try to sit down and think about it, I think what you are proposing is even more provocative. Now, we may be asked to just count the votes, and then whoever has the largest number of votes will win. But I think we are more about arguments and logic than just securing the number of votes. Can you not stop and take over Martin Liu's, um CSA? I think that would resolve everything, at least to me. I think you can resolve the majority of the outstanding issues, and you will get it enacted. I think you will have the greatest number of members supporting the third reading of the bill. So for the last time, I just want to ask whether you will be reflecting our opinion to the STH, that is, accept Martin Neal's CSA, which can take into account both aspects. Deputy Secretary. Well, within the government, we've uh, had a discussion. For Mr. Martin Liu's amendment, we see a problem with it. That's why, uh, actually, at the beginning, I said 
the administration believed that negative vetting is the right way forward, but we want to respond to members' views. That's why we're willing to do this. So that's the whole background to that. Now, uh, for Mr. Martin Liu's amendment, it may seem that it's immediate effect, but then um, there is still positive vetting uh, uh, that follows. So that's why you think it's not appropriate. We cannot accept it. That's why we're proposing this. Mr. Kenneth Leung. He's a table and motion. Now, I did say I wasn't going to come because, um, um, you know, we have um, uh, a tight schedule. But can you please um, manage your time properly? Well, okay, then three minutes each, please. There are a lot of issues. I don't think I can finish them. Why am I so unhappy? I have no problems with the direction or the content of the bill, but then the adjustment mechanism. If it's upward adjustment, is uh, positive vetting, negative is. Uh, um, um, uh, how did I find out? I, w I only learned about this proposal on the front page of a newspaper on a, a newspaper store, and that's how we found out about this proposal. Do you think it's ridiculous? It's a joke. Now you say um, Section 63A is great, negative vetting. Let's say this bill is passed in this uh, in this form. Let's say if the rate is to be changed, uh, BSD is to be increased from 15% to 30%. Uh, that's a hypothetical case. So it will come into effect immediately, and then you come to LegCo for negative vetting. If unfortunately the negative vetting uh, after two months of discussion. Uh, the the amendment couldn't get through. The uh, extra 15% of BSD collected under this bill would it be refunded to the buyers? Deputy Secretary, first point: the government's undertaking is uh, no, no. I don't want to talk about that undertaking. I want you to answer my hypothetical question. That's it. Let's say we go to negative vetting. No, no refund because it uh, comes into effect immediately. I have no further questions then. So that's all about the Section 63A mechanism, but uh, since I still have time left. Public Revenue Protection Ordinance, Cap 120. Mr. Martin Leo's CSA. Shares the same spirit of um, Cap 120, Revenue Protection Ordinance. Although there's just a um, um, time limit of four months in the public revenue protection ordinance, at least you must complete a positive vetting within four months. Otherwise, you will have to refund the extra tax back to taxpayers. Cap 120, public revenue ordinance, public revenue protection ordinance. It's not just about protecting public revenue. I've done some research myself. In 1999, uh, Denise Yu was then the Secretary for Financial Services. She talked about the coverage of CAP 120. She cited an example, um, fixed penalty tra uh, ticket for a traffic offence. Um, that order under the Public Revenue Protection Ordinance was uh, made to uh, Bring into immediate effect the um, penalty. Some members uh, oppose that, but how come you don't uh, do it the same way? How come you try to come up with something so funny, Deputy Secretary? Oh, I don't think I can give you time uh, to speak anymore, Mr. Alan Leung. I'd just like to put on record um, uh, several points in this debate. I think we should um, openly condemn. Professor Anthony Cheung and Mr. Yao Xing Mo, they are principal officials. They are politically accountable. Now today, tomorrow, they say they're going to give another taking with political um, consequence. But then they didn't come up here. Uh, they sent uh, Miss Wong here. She shouldn't have to suffer all this because she's not a politically accountable official. That's the first point. Second point. Ms. Wong mentioned several times the wine tax, that is, dutiable commodities tax, duty, and the first registration tax for motor vehicles. She cited this example several times. I'm sure Ms. Wong would agree. For uh, those um, types of adjustment, they're covered by the Public Revenue Protection Ordinance Cap 120. 
Notice if um, in the course of negative vetting, the government should choose to veto the tax rate proposed by the government, taxpayers will get a refund. This case is a special case. It's to make it easier for Hong Kong people to buy their homes and for those who try to speculate in the market and push up prices, they will have to pay a price. In that case, I don't know why we're not using the same logic. Because if you allow this logic, then you should be able to embrace Martin Liu's amendment. Third point. The Deputy Secretary actually agreed with me. For uh, upward adjustment, uh, is introduction of bill, the downward adjustment, negative vetting, she agrees, is not desirable, it's not logical. Now the administration is asking the legislature to support an amendment that is not logical, that is not desirable. How preposterous could that be? And the final point I'd like to put on record is the administration said that if it should renege on this promise, the legislature would not let it off so easily. But whether I want to let them off the hook, there's nothing I can do because Section 63A will stay in our statute book. If you insist on, on reneging on your promise, what can we do to stop you? Uh, at most, I could move a motion of no confidence in the Secretary. But for the tax money collected in the seven months, uh, seven weeks, the government could just keep it. That's where the problem lies. Dr. Lam Tai Fei. Madam Chair, you said uh, it's after it's past the deadline for members to move amendment, and you came up with this amendment, but there's nothing uh, out of the blue. I think you are just trying to defend your position. You're not going to help to, to improve legislature executive relations. Today, I think we must get this right. That, uh, that is what the legal advisor said. The legal advisor made it very clear. A verbal undertaking of the government has no legal effect. If the administration should renege on this verbal undertaking, members of this council or the public could only take the government to task. That is a very important point. And just now the Deputy Secretary said the government wouldn't um, make undertakings lightly. She believes that um, the next term of the government will still be under a lot of pressure in making good the promise. So there have to be strong justifications for not keeping the promise. So there is a small chance, there is a small chance that uh, the undertaking would not be honored. Ah, that's scary. That, that, so you're saying that there's still a chance that the promise won't be honored. So for a piece of legislation, should it be enforced by way of uh, uh, legislation? Do we just uh, rely on moral pressure, political pressure, or administrative means to enforce a piece of legislation? Is that what we want? That's really the core question. This council is to scrutinize people. We make laws. If everything could be done without um, con regulation by law, we can just go by administrative means, we can go by um, moral practices, then you could just suspend the Legislative Council, then we can just leave everything to the executive alone. Of course, that's not going to be the case. So we have to be listen very carefully to what the Deputy Secretary said. We have to take very seriously what the government said. If we overlook the advice of the legal advisor, and we keep uh, debating such approaches, then forget about uh, discussing anything in future. There's no need to discuss anything on a legal basis. Anything could be done by way of oral pledges or moral standards or administrative measures. That's all. That is totally pointless. There's no point for us to study papers. In the past year, there, there shouldn't have been a need for us to go through each uh, clause one by one. Uh, as long as the government undertakes to give exemption, that's fine. Or not give exemption, that's all. There's no need for us to consider in the context of the bill. So this cannot be allowed. Madam Chair, do we have the duty, the power, to continue to discuss this uh, oral undertaking of the government? 
next to Miss Emily Long. Madam Chair, you mentioned me. You said you had discussion with the administration. Yes, agree. There should be communication with the administration, but not the way you do it. First of all, I didn't know you were going to meet with them. I didn't know what you were going to say. You spoke today in a meeting. What you and Jeffrey Lamb talked uh, to the government. Now the government has come out to do this. No one is giving support. Even if DAB supports it, they, they didn't say a word. FTU is not even here. So you cannot really represent us, Rep Madam Chair. We didn't ask you to represent us. If you had told us, now I'm going to go to the government to say this to them, we would have stopped you. But anyway, having heard all the views, Madam Chair, I'm sure you know this now. In this position, in this circumstances, there's no way the government to, to take this through. Now you say, well, Martin Liao has moved an amendment, uh, James Toe has moved an amendment, so it's uh, up to members to make their choice. In that case, I think the secretary could just retract his uh, verbal undertaking. It's pointless. Uh, having heard them, it seems that they don't really care. They say they will still want to do it by negative vetting, but they just want to, um, you know, take this, uh, uh, push this through. In that case, you might as well just retract the undertaking. So if we like uh, Martin Leo's amendment, we vote for him, or we vote for James Toe's amendment. I think that will be less controversy. Now. Madam Chair, you said you've heard uh, everybody, that's why you've taken our polls, and that's why you probably asked the government to make this undertaking. Uh, he ha the, the government hasn't met with anyone else, not even uh, developers, perhaps. I, first of all, I think it's uh, bad that the uh, Secretary is not here. For members who spoke here, no one ever sub uh, expressed support for this so-called undertaking, except uh, Regina Ip. You know, only the three of you, EXCO members, no one else supports the undertaking. So I think the, uh, the chairperson is giving you a way out. Just um, let us vote on the other amendments. Uh, Martin Liao, it remains invisible. He's not here yet, uh, but he's come up with such a bright idea. Now, in that case, in future, there's no need to join a bills committee, you know, where you can finish your work and all of a sudden someone else just moves an amendment. That's all. And everybody says that they support him, but the government wouldn't support him. So you see what a mess we're in. But if the government insists on listening to certain people who don't represent us, and that is, you give this undertaking, I think uh, you are headed for disaster. So uh, I don't think any member should claim to represent us, because if you do represent us, they should be taken up at meetings. You should have known we wouldn't support you. If you had told us, we would have stopped you. We would have told you, no, we would not agree to that. But now nobody agrees except you, Regina Ip, and Jeff Jeffrey Lam. Otherwise, tomorrow morning, next morning, uh, when we wake up, we watch the news, you see that uh, something's changed. So let's forget about it. Just focus on the amendments moved. If uh, people support um, Martin Liao's amendment, yes, then we can support the bill. Now, when I went to meet with the secretary, I never said I represented members, since you said so, Ms. Emily Lau. I never told him I, I, I represented members. I just told him I, convey, I wanted to convey the views of, that I've heard from members. How could I represent every member? But uh, which member asked you to come up with this uh, sort of arrangement? I think in the electrical paper is already noted. So if you want, any, anyone has access to the Bills Committee report. Anyway, Deputy Secretary, uh, members have put forward a request. Um, they asked the Secretary to consider it. So what do you think? Quick response, please. We've heard members' views. Of course, I will. Um, convey these views to the secretary. Last member, please. We have to draw a line some uh, now, Mr. Abraham Shack. There are several principles to go by in making laws. Um, um, these proposals must be lawful, legitimate, and reasonable. If we go by these principles, now, uh, of course, we can't argue with you. Um, whether something's lawful, you can cite the Revenue Protection Ordinance as you like. Actually, during the Bills Committee meeting, I asked this question of the Deputy Secretary. And she said it's not a revenue, so that's why it's different. Now, since it's different, you shouldn't quote uh, the Revenue Protection Ordinance again. So don't just um, quote things uh, at your whim. And I accept your explanation, Madam Chair. 
you represented me in meeting with the secretary. I thank you for that. Also, I now I represent you because uh, my amendments are the same as your views. So what I'm saying is actually your views. You've uh, said this many times at the bills committee. That's the first point. Second point, I'd like to say this to Emily Lau. You must not always target property developers. Now, you make all these accusations without evidence. Where is your evidence? Developers never said uh, they are against the harsh measures. Developers would wa only want Hong Kong permanent residents to buy properties in the name of Hong Kong established companies. It's just that the Democratic Party dares not support the amendment of Abraham Sheck. If you have got Emily Lau, Democratic Party, support my amendment. And property never developers never said uh, uh, anything about positive vetting or negative vetting, but rather Abraham Sheck, as a legislator, uh, wants to defend the position of Lechko, and that's why I've said this. So please don't just make um, a false ac uh, ad and discriminate accusations. And then Mrs. Regina, you quoted some examples about human rights now. But then the uh, barrier, the, the threshold is low uh, when it comes to defending human rights. So we're not talking about human rights here. We're talking about taxation. So don't use that example. So the examples she quoted are totally irrelevant. So before I drew the line, um, Mr. Kenneth Lung raised his hand. So just one minute for you. Uh, I just want to talk about the wording of my motion. I think you have all got a copy of my motion. I would like to make some technical adjustments. The sixth line, but not yet discussed at all within this bills committee. I would like to say that there has been no in-depth discussion by the bills committee, because just now we have had some discussion. We haven't had any in-depth discussion at the policy level, so I hope the administration can defer the resumption of the second reading of the Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2012. On the 19th and on the 26th of March, um, we do have let go sitting, so we can have the bill uh, the bill's second reading resumed on those two days. Um, I'm moving this mo uh, mo uh, I'm moving this motion because we haven't been respected by the administration at all since the Saturday announcement about the change. And then for the negative vetting and positive negative and uh, positive vetting, maybe the public do not quite understand the mechanism. Maybe we should have a meeting or two to deal with this particular issue. Thank you. Ms. Wong, I think uh, your position is clear. Thank you, Madam Chair. The admin's position is clear. We have already started the second reading process with no intention to defer the resumption of a second reading debate. Legal advisor, anything to add concerning the bill? We have already uh, started the process to resume the second reading debate, and it is an act from the government. Now, the government has no intention to defer the process. Now, if we are to put this matter to the vote, um, so it's just a matter of uh, making clear our stance. Sorry, speakers of mic. Ronnie Tong. It's up to you to make a decision. It's not for the government to uh, make a decision. For your own view, you keep it to yourself. All right. Uh, what about the motion? Do you have any comments on the voting of the motion? Um, Kenneth Leung, uh, I would like to claim a division. Mr. Wang Ting Kwong. Any Legal, uh, any bonding effect on the bills committee? Just positioning, posturing? Uh, I uh, did not get your answer clearly. So it is not binding on the bills committee, right? Uh, legal advisor, please. This motion expresses the view of this bills committee. It has no legislative effect. It has no legal effect. Whether it is to be endorsed or not, I want to know whether it will be regarded as the positioning of the Bills Committee. Yes, the position of the Bills Committee, but merely a position. 
understood. Any other questions? Sorry, speaker of mic. Even though it has no legally binding effect, it should be respected. If the bills committee is to endorse this uh, motion, since we ourselves vote on the matter, of course it's binding on us. Wang Ting Kuang, well, we have already endorsed when the bill should go to the House GUM. We have had decisions made concerning the resumption of the second reading so and so forth. So are we um, overflowing all the other previous decisions? Ring the bell. Uh, any other questions? Yes, we should ring the bell to have the voting procedure. Yes, uh, please uh, summon members to come back. We want to claim a division.
咁啊記名我就喺讀出，咁邊個係委員？就係爭我曬人命飛啫，係嘛？係啦，好咁啊，請。All right, time is up. So, bills committee members, uh, those who are in favour, please raise your hands, and I'm going to read out your names: Li Chet Yen, Emily Lau, Kenneth Leung, James To, Wu Chi Wei, uh, Alan Leung, uh, Ronnie Tong, Tommy Zhang, Abraham Shek, and Lam Tai Fai. Sorry, I were too, I was too fast. Let me read it out again. Emily Lau, Richard Yen, James To, Kenneth Leung, Wu Chi Wei, Anna Leung, Ron Tong, Tommy Zhang, Shek Lai Him, Lam Tai Fai. All the names are done. Nine votes in support of Kenneth Leung's motion. Those who are against, sorry, the secretary is trying to follow this up. Ten votes. Ten. Those who are against, hands up, please. Wong Kok Kin, Ang Zhang, um, Wong Ding Guang, Liang Zicheng, Regina Yip. Any abstentions? You are not a member. Sorry, so you can't take part in the voting. This motion has been passed. Anything to say? I'm going to respect the decision of the both committee and tell the STH you can send an email or SMS to us this night. Uh, it's better if you do it before 12 midnight. Either send us an email or SMS. So, all right, Ms. Wong, so you get it from the members. All right. If there isn't anything under AOB, meeting adjourned. Ten. Against four. 